You know, as I've mentioned before, you could go through this whole RCIA and learn everything that there is to know about the Catholic Church, everything the Catholic Church teaches about Jesus Christ, teaches about Almighty God, and you could still remain an atheist. In fact, some of the most learned people in the truths of the church are people who have no faith whatsoever, but they know what the truths are. They simply don't believe them. I would say that is kind of useless. Why in the world uh, have all this knowledge about God and the church and church history and not allow it to affect you in some personal way? So what I want to talk about tonight is how Jesus Christ is a part of the church and continues to be so, that he's not a dead hero from 2,000 years ago, but he is the living Lord, the risen Lord, who remains with us in the Holy Spirit. Now, in my own experience as a, a Catholic, both as a priest and before becoming a priest, some of the, the most devout Catholics or Christians that I know are not people who have a lot of intellectual knowledge about the church and about Jesus Christ. They can't really explain to you what the Holy Trinity is. They don't, under, un, don't really understand how Jesus became human of the Virgin Mary and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but they believe that Jesus Christ loves them and they love him in a very personal way just as they would love their spouse or their child or or someone else in their family and so for them Jesus Christ is as real as anyone in this room and they love him and are committed to him and seek his forgiveness when they sin and they pray to him and they pray daily so that's really what the faith of the church is all about allowing the relationship that Jesus Christ has to each one of us to enable us to respond to Jesus Christ by knowing, loving, and serving Him. But we have to make sure that the Jesus that we know, that we get to know and love personally, is the Jesus of the New Testament. Because sometimes, because of human frailty, human sinfulness, we can sometimes make Jesus or make Almighty God into our own image rather than into the image of truly uh, who Jesus is as the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And so the Bible, the New Testament, is the uh, foundation of helping us to know personally who the risen Lord is. Uh, because by knowing the Jesus of history, of, of his public ministry 2,000 years ago, and what the early church believed about Jesus Christ, we come to an accurate and orthodox understanding of who Jesus is. So the New Testament consists of 27 books com com compiled by early Christian believers. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, it took nearly 100 years to develop the writings of the New Testament, and another 200 years for the church to determine what would be classified uh, as the books of the New Testament, what we would call the canon of the New Testament. The New Testament is broken down into four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, which is actually the second part of the Gospel of Luke, 21 letters, mostly written by St. Paul, challenging, correcting, guiding, and, and encouraging new Christian communities to hold steadfast in their faith and their new beliefs. Then there are other letters attributed to St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. And then finally, there's a highly symbolic book called the Book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, uh, which gives hope to people under persecution and really shows that uh, in a very symbolic way what the Catholic Mass is and, and what the Heavenly Mass is. Uh, and, and the Book of Revelation is really a, a very fascinating book. Now, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, uh, developed only gradually in the early church. The first stage of the development of the Gospels was in the events that actually took place in the life of Jesus. But prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, even the closest associates of Jesus probably did not fully comprehend who he was, even though they were with him personally day in and day out. It only gradually 
uh, was revealed to them uh, the true nature of Jesus, and ultimately it was until the resurrection that they finally grasped, oh, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God. Uh, so Mark's gospel is the oldest, and it portrays the, gospel, it, it portrays the apostles as very dumb. They're very ignorant of who he is. And because Mark's gospel is the oldest, written maybe around 55 AD, the fact that the apostles come off looking very stupid historically is probably very accurate. Uh, because uh, uh, it being the oldest written gospel, uh, it would have the most accurate historical reflections of what actually occurred uh, during the, the public ministry of, of Jesus. The second stage was, after Jesus died, was the preaching by the evangelists uh, after his resurrection. And this is what's called the oral stage. They initially believed that Jesus would return immediately, so there was no need to write things in a book form. It wasn't until they realized that the second coming would be delayed that they understood that they better get all of this oral tradition that was going around uh, for now maybe 70 or 80 years written into a book form. And that's what we call uh, actually writing down the oral tradition in a big book form with a particular um, summary of the life of Jesus that pertains to the needs of the community in which the gospel was formed. Uh, so this took about a hundred years to take place. And you can imagine if, if I'm privileged enough to hear evangelists preach about Jesus Christ, those who knew Jesus personally, and these stories are handed down from one generation to the next or one person to the next, uh, that I would have an insight greater into who Jesus was, uh, more so than maybe the apostles did when they were walking with him. Does because we have uh, hindsight now, whereas the apostles during the life of Jesus were kind of trying to figure him out. But after the resurrection, they knew who he was, and they uh, proclaimed that, and ultimately it came to us, it comes to us in a written form. So Matthew's gospel has a particular slant on who Jesus is and how people responded to him. Mark's gospel does the same thing as well as Luke's. John's gospel is the last to be written, and it has the highest understanding of who Jesus is. His gospel was written about 100 AD. And uh, it's just amazing, you know, uh, when you look at how Jesus is described in the Gospel of John, he is totally triumphant, knows who he is all along, everybody knows who he is, and uh, he is looking forward to his death on the cross because the cross will be the throne on which he will reign over the world. So it has a very unique and uh, fulfilling understanding of who Jesus is. So under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the church has taught authoritatively about the nature of Jesus. We must accept it not only with our minds, but also with our hearts. So our faith is very much tied into not only the intellectual pursuit of the knowledge of who Jesus is, but allowing him to change our hearts and to change the direction of our, of our lives, or to get us back on track if we uh, get derailed in one way or another through sin. So through the eyes of faith, based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, a new understanding of Jesus' life developed. And uh, that the apostles may not have understood prior to the resurrection. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is what motivates us to understand who Jesus is. Based on that, we start looking at the other events in Jesus' life and interpret them in the light of the resurrection. So in other words, what I'm saying is, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead after he was crucified on Good Friday is central to our understanding of Jesus and our acknowledgement of who he is and the authority that he has in our lives. If not for the resurrection, Jesus would remain just a dead hero of history. But because of the resurrection, we see him in a totally different light. We see him as risen and alive. And then the Gospels help us to understand who he is and who we are to be in relationship with him. So let's look at, uh, uh, with the eyes of the resurrection, let's, let's look at the birth of Jesus. The Gospel relates to us that Mary was chosen by God to be the mother of his son. And that this message was communicated to her by way of an angel. 
In the Annunciation, the angel of the Lord tells Mary that she is to conceive Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will be known as the Son of God. From a biological point of view, this miraculous uh, uh, birth of Jesus is just that. It's a miracle. There is no human father. Yet, a biological conception takes place. God is the father of Jesus. Mary is Jesus' mother. And from Mary, Jesus as God takes on or inherits our human nature. Yet, he remains God. Jesus is divine and human. So this is the most critical part of, of our understanding of who Jesus is based on the gospel. That Jesus Christ is one divine being who becomes flesh through the Blessed Virgin Mary and through that has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. But he's one divine being. Now. Are we all confused yet? Because that's a mystery of faith, uh, what I'm describing to you. For us to believe that Jesus Christ is one divine being with two natures, a human and divine nature, is a mystery of faith that we can't understand. How can God condescend to become like us, take on who we are in our flesh, and then suffer and die for us? That's really the, the core of the gospel, that Jesus Christ becomes one of us uh, and Jesus Christ is God. But you might ask then, what is the Immaculate Conception? Well, the Immaculate Conception does not refer to how Jesus was conceived uh, in the womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the assistance of a human uh, man. It refers rather to Mary being chosen by God from the moment of her conception to be the mother of his son, and that he consecrated her from the moment of her conception in the womb of her mother for this awesome ministry that she would experience. So, so when you hear the word Immaculate Conception, make sure uh, that you understand that that refers not to the virgin birth or the virgin conception, but rather to Mary's conception which took place in the normal way. But at that point, God preserved her from original sin. Now, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke make perfectly clear that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament hopes. That God would send a Messiah to save his people from sin and lead them to heaven. So the Gospels make clear that Jesus came not only to fulfill the hopes of the Jews, but he came as the Messiah for everyone, Jews and Gentiles and everyone who would be open to the Word of God. In fact, um, when you look at the story of the Magi, the three Magi, although the Gospels don't say what number they are, but tradition has said that they are three, and their names are Baltazar, Gaspar, and Melchior. But you can't find those names in... Uh, the Gospels, because those are names that tradition has given to them. They represent the Gentile world. They're astrologers. They study the moon and the stars, the sun. In fact, they worship them. Uh, and by coming to Jesus and offering them their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the Gospels indicate that a conversion takes place, that they turn away from their pagan religion of worshiping the stars, the sun, the moon, and everything else, and they accept Jesus Christ and his church and return home by another route. Now, you can take that literally, that they took a different road to get back to their destination where they live, or you could say that the new route was the Christian way. The church. They were now Christians. Uh, and so even the, the infancy narratives of Jesus' birth uh, indicate that Jesus is not only the Messiah of the Jews, but he is also the Messiah of everyone. So the most important <clears throat> message of the birth of Jesus is that God has become one of us, is like us, in all things but sin. Uh, so we do not believe as Christians that Jesus Christ ever sinned. Now I know that several years ago there were many movies put out. Uh, one was called The Life of Brian and the other The Temptation of Christ that somehow Jesus in his humanity did sin. That is not 
Orthodox Christian belief. Uh, we believe that Jesus Christ never sinned. Um, but we do believe that by becoming human, God understands human beings in our world, and he understands it not as evil but in need, or in need of destruction, but as sinful and in need of redemption. So that's the most important thing that we gather from Jesus. Now after the birth of uh, Jesus, and up until he was about 12 years old, or after that, um, we don't know very much about what happened in his teenage and adult years. The Gospels tell us that Jesus simply grew in wisdom and knowledge, which tells us that Almighty God, by becoming human, limited himself. Uh, and was capable of learning as any human being was or is capable of learning. And that's kind of an amazing thing when you stop and think about it. Now there are some scholars who would say that, Christian scholars, Catholic scholars, who would say that Jesus from the moment he was born knew everything about everything because he's God. Others would say, without denying that Jesus is God, that by becoming human being, a human being, he limited himself and put himself into a situation or uh, an environment where he could experience what human beings experience. That he could experience ignorance and learning and growing in wisdom. What do you all think about that? What is your own perspective? Did Jesus know everything always from the moment that he was a child till he was crucified on the cross? Or did he have uh, ignorance that had to be overcome by education and growing in uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge. What would you say on that? I want to. I want one of those that is not a, a, a Catholic to answer that. <laughs> he's, God. he's God during his public ministry. So you think he knew everything from the moment that uh, he was born? God. So it was all a masquerade, his learning and growing in, in wisdom. No, you can get smarter. Okay, okay, so there was a possibility that he could grow and get smarter. Okay, anybody else? I think, if he, I, think he, I think he had free will to do right and wrong, always chose right, mm -hmm. never sinned, mm -hmm. and, and learned and grew that way. So I mm -hmm. believe that he didn't know everything in the godly sense. And that's possible. I'd say that in Catholic theology, both ways of thinking are possible. But now that Jesus is risen from the dead, he knows everything. I mean, so, so we're really just talking about a 33-year period in the life of, of the uh, historical Jesus. And what did he know and what didn't he know? Uh, and did he only gradually come aware of who his real identity was as time went on? Uh, and that's open to uh, discussion and, 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 you know, reflection. Do we know for sure? No, absolutely not. But we do know for sure that now Jesus is completely aware of who he is, that he is the Son of God, and he reigns as the Son of God from heaven, and he sends us the Holy Spirit. But maybe, you know, it took uh, 30 years for him to really be prepared for his public ministry and to, for him to understand the power that he had to... Uh, effect miracles, to forgive sins, to raise people from the dead. Uh, but certainly, by the end of his public ministry, he was pretty well aware of who he was. Yes? He had to pray often in order to know the will of the Father. Right. And, and so what we're saying is that his humanity was not just a masquerade. That he truly was human, even though he was truly divine. And what is, I think, amazing from my perspective is that God was willing to limit himself in that moment of history uh, in such a way that, that he himself could learn. Does that make sense? Yes, Cerise. Um, in Philippians, it also says there that uh, he emptied himself of his blood. Right. Right. So there's, uh, there's basis for believing that in Scripture. But I have to say that there is some Catholic theology or, or devotional practices that would say, well, Jesus just knew it all, and there was never any question about anything. Uh, and he had a, a, a divine purpose, and he carried it out. And you can believe that as a Catholic as well. But I think when you look at the Scriptures, uh, his, public, his 33 years here on earth, you can debate. What we can't debate is that he committed any sins. 
Uh, now, was he tempted? Certainly. Uh, and Satan did tempt him. Uh, could he have sinned? I'm going to refer that to Deacon Mongan. <laughs> Is it possible that the Son of God and the Son of Mary could have given in to temptation? Um, I don't believe so because he had no original sin. Right. And he was perfect. Right. He had a perfect relationship with God the Father, and therefore he could not sin because of his very nature. Right. Man, and he's 100% redeemed man. <laughs> so, so, uh, so from that perspective, Catholic theology would say that uh, it, it was impossible for him to commit sin. And that the only way that he could be put to death was by taking on himself our sins. So he experienced sin, but not his own personal sin. He experienced sin through our sin. Does that make sense? And that's what enabled him uh, to be to be killed, uh, that the, his humanity could be cu killed uh, uh, through that experience. Okay? Now the question remains, if Jesus is one divine being with two natures, human and divine, was his divine nature killed along with his human nature? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that's why this is not a... a uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, he's not play acting here. Uh, this is for real. And his three days in the tomb uh, indicate that uh, you know the, we killed God. And yet God did not take revenge on us. He redeemed us through the resurrection. Uh, <clears throat> but it's because of the humanity of Jesus that the, the divine part of Jesus died as well, suffered and died, okay, and rose again on the third day. Okay, so when you look at uh, the public ministry of Jesus, which begins at the age of 30 or so, it begins with uh, the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, a sign from God as to who Jesus is, made clear after the resurrection. Uh, in fact, I would say that the uh, baptism of Jesus was an aha moment for those who witnessed it because what occurred at the baptism of Jesus that made it perfectly clear to those that were there? God spoke. The voice of God was heard to say, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. So God makes clear that Jesus is His Son and ad identifies Him as such. Jesus leaves his private, obscured life and enters the public arena, kind of like what you're going to be doing on uh, uh, Sunday. Uh, we're going to declare that, hey, these people are interested in becoming Catholic. They've been secret up until this time, and now they're coming out in the open. Okay? Okay. But the other thing about the baptism of Jesus is, why, was Jesus, why did Jesus allow himself to be baptized if he had no sins to repent of? Well, I would say that it was in anticipation of what he would do when he would wash away our sins by taking, him, take, taking those sins upon his, his own body. Uh, and so the washing of Jesus indicates that at the de death on the cross and his resurrection, our, all of our sins are washed away. So it's kind of a, 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 um, a precursor of what will actually happen as he begins his public ministry, it shows what will actually happen at the end of his public ministry. Jesus also chose special followers. Jesus gathered around himself fishermen, tax collectors, and known sinners. He was not afraid to associate with those who were considered uh, impure. The disciples had to follow Jesus, travel with him, to listen to him, and to see what he did. There is always a uh, consistency between what Jesus teaches and what Jesus lives. But he is not a one-man show. Eventually he will send his followers, his disciples, his apostles out to do what he did. So Jesus is not um, a cult figure, if you will, that kind of you know, uh, makes himself the most important person in the world. But he gathers a lot of people around him and enables them to do what he is doing. And that's what the purpose of the church is, to do the same thing, to gather as many people as possible to continue to do what Jesus did through all the people that the church sends out now uh, to act in the name of, of, of Jesus Christ. When Jesus, what Jesus does is to perform miracles. He calmed the seas, he healed the paralyzed, he raised the dead back to life.
He changed water into wine. And these are all ways in which we get assurance that Jesus is God. Jesus also forgives sins. Jesus acts with the same authority as God. In other words, Jesus is God. In fact, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, the most controversial one was the act of forgiving people. And that really got him into trouble with the religious Jews of the day because they said, well, who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And that's the point. That's who he thinks he is. Uh, and that's who we should think he is and know he is because not only does he do the miracles, but he forgives sins, and that's the greatest miracle, uh, because the forgiveness of sins reunites us to God. Jesus proclaimed a new message for all God's people. God's kingdom is already here on earth, and it begins with Jesus and his public ministry, but it awaits its fulfillment. God desires an intimate relationship with his people. We can call him Abba, which means Daddy, or Father. We, can, we are called to love God and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus suffered and died. He took our sins on himself, experienced suffering and death. Jesus experienced not, over, not only physical pain of the passion, but the pain of being betrayed by one he loved and trusted. The church understands suffering to be embraced and that it is good when we unite our suffering to Jesus' suffering on the cross. So after Jesus' suffering and crucifixion, three days later he is raised. And all of us who give our sins to Jesus suffer and die with him, and we will be raised as well with him. In fact, Jesus died for every sin that we have ever committed. Uh, so he experienced every sin uh, from the first original sin to uh, sins that will take place in the future until the last human being uh, is on earth. All of those sins were placed upon him so that we could be redeemed. So Jesus Christ is Lord and we must accept him as such through the church. Now we also believe that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, the Blessed Trinity. Uh, we have, have the Father who is the Creator, we have the Son, who is the Word, and we have the Spirit that, uh, by which all comes about, all things come about. So be, be, before becoming human, Jesus was God's Word. He was always there. So Jesus, as the divine Son of God, even before He took flesh, He existed. Okay? So Jesus in his existence prior to becoming a human being is the Word of God, uh, the eternal Word. And where do we understand that? What scripture passage tells us that explicitly? What book of the Gospel I should ask? The Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, God was, and the Word of God always was. Uh, uh, it's a very powerful thing when you stop and think about it. But in a moment in human history, that Word became human. Uh, so therefore we would say that Jesus is the second person of the, of the Trinity. So you have Father who is Creator, um, uh, Son who is the Word or Redeemer, and we have the Holy Spirit uh, that is the Sanctifier, the, that which makes holy. So before becoming human, Jesus was God's Word and He was always there. But in a, time, a particular time and place He became human. The Word was made flesh. But Jesus was also human. He had, a he had bodily functions. He felt emotions. He had to learn. He grew tired and hungry and weak. Jesus is one divine person with two natures, as I mentioned, human and divine. Jesus came to live, to suffer, and to die so that we can live eternally. Uh, and, and that's the most important thing, that, that throughout our lives we must present ourselves to, to Christ repentantly so, because we can't enter the kingdom of God or really into the complete presence of Christ without repentance, without acknowledging our sins and trusting that God forgives us. So I always say that when a Catholic goes to confession, even before they set foot in the confessional, they are in a repentant mode. They're seeking God's forgiveness. Uh, and then that repentance is what enables them to experience the grace that God wants them to have to be reunited with Him and to be part of heaven. The same thing is true when we go to heaven. We can't go to heaven unrepentant. 
uh, we can't live in heaven uh, still contemplating sins. Uh, so something happens by the time that we face God at our particular judgment and he allows us to enter into heaven that we're purified of our sins and our, and our disposition to sin and we're made perfect. Uh, but all of that comes about through our own personal repentance. We know from the Old Testament that God is creator, he's a father, he, and he's loving. When God speaks, it is created. God creates the world by his word that is spoken. And this comes about through the Holy Spirit. So when we get to the New Testament, especially the Gospel of John, the word of God is Jesus made flesh. What the Holy Spirit is, is elaborated upon also, especially in the book of Acts. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament will enable the church to infallibly declare the dogma of the Most Holy Trinity. There is one God with three divine persons, each equal, each distinct, yet one God. So when you experience any one of the divine persons, you experience God fully. And that has ramifications for Jesus Christ in his public ministry and as risen Lord. We don't just experience the Word of God, we experience the Father and the Holy Spirit in Jesus, both in His public ministry and now through the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can't experience just the Holy Spirit without experiencing the Father and the Son. You can't experience just the Father without experiencing Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that's a very important concept to keep in mind, or, or theology, or doctrine if you will. In Jesus, and because of his hum humanity, the pure Holy Spirit that is God became flesh. We can see, hear, and touch Jesus in the flesh at a particular time in salvation history. But when we read the stories of Jesus, he is uh, really present to us in the here and now as well. So after his ascension, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to guide the church and to assist individual believers. So I think the easiest way, which is a dumbed-down version, version to, uh, of understanding God as Holy Trinity, is to think of water. Water is water, right? But it has three natures. It has the liquid form, it has the solid form, which is ice, and it has the uh, vapor form, which is steam. Liquid, solid, and steam are all different and unique, right? But in each one of those you experience the total, correct? Uh, well, the same thing is true with the, the Holy Trinity. There is one God, but three divine persons, but they are yet one being. Uh, but what's unique about the second person, or the, the, the word, is that in a particular time and place in the course of salvation history, that word became flesh, and God limited himself in order to redeem us. So, <clears throat> after Jesus' resurrection, people saw him. This is what our faith is based upon. They touched him, they ate with him, and after 40 days he departed from them through the ascension and went to the right hand of God to prepare a place for us and to send us the Holy Spirit. And from God's right hand, Jesus continues to send the church the Holy Spirit to lead, to preserve, and to guide the, the, the church, to help the church, meaning all of us, to do what Jesus did. We also believe that Jesus Christ will come again at the end of salvation history. At death, which is the end of our own personal history, whenever that takes place, we will experience personal judgment. But we also believe that there will be a general judgment at the end of time, and that all things will be laid bare. We'll know how institutions and the church and governments and all, how well they fared uh, in their travels in this life, and we'll see the, the final judgment kind of make, help everything to, be, to make sense. But our belief as Catholics is that the tangible order of the world will be redeemed. We should view the second coming not with fear, but with hope. Um, in fact, I always say, you know, in the first coming of Jesus Christ, he came as an infant, correct? Did Jesus Christ strike fear and horror and trembling into the hearts of those for whom he was born at the nativity, his first coming? 
No, the angels were saying glory to God in the highest. The shepherds came and bowed down and worshipped Him. The Magi did the same thing. This was good news. Okay? Somehow, over the course of centuries, we've turned the second coming into Christ into some terrible, horrible uh, event uh, <clears throat> that should strike fear and terror into our very hearts. Now, why would we think that that would be the case when God didn't do it in the first place, when uh, Jesus Christ came uh, in the flesh 2,000 years ago? So I would say that if you're on the right side of God, you've been trying to live a good and upright life, you are repentant, you celebrate Mass every Sunday, you go to confession regularly, <clears throat> at the second coming, as well as your own personal judgment, you're going to say, glory to God in the highest. You're not going to be afraid okay, of anything. Um, and, and I think that's our sure and uh, certain faith in terms of who Jesus is and who we are in relationship to him. I was in our fourth grade class last week and I was talking about the last judgment. And I was asking the kids, how many of you are afraid of the second coming of Jesus Christ? And they all raised their hands, you know. Uh, everybody is. I was afraid, you know. I, I used to have friends uh, that belonged to the Church of God, a Pentecostal group, and they were constantly in the 1960s saying that Jesus was going to come uh, and on a particular date and time. I think it was uh, May 14th, 1964. And I can remember going to bed on May 13th, 1964, and I said a very good act of contrition, and I was sweating. I was so nervous uh, that, that if, if he were to come in the middle of the night, I thought, well, this is, you know, I was afraid. But we shouldn't really be afraid if we're united to, to Jesus and, and that, uh, you know, it, the, the second judgment or the second coming, the, the general judgment of Jesus Christ will, in fact, be a marvelous thing that we should all anticipate. And our own personal judgment will be that way as well. If we have been trying to live a good life, try to repent and have always uh, within us a repentant attitude. I think then we, we have nothing to fear. So does anybody have any questions before we move on to our rehearsal? Oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying back there, now if your head's not spinning, because, you know, I mean, really, if you go back into history, <clears throat> All this about Jesus that Father shared with you, these were big, huge debates that went on for centuries about the nature of Jesus. And so if you struggle with it, don't be surprised. Because the early Christians struggled with it. In fact, um, I, I didn't want to go into a lot of history tonight because of the rehearsal, but um, you know, in the early church there were groups of people who said Jesus is only divine, his human nature is just a mirage. Others are saying he's just a human being, uh, and his, he's not really, he, God couldn't have uh, limited himself. And so there were groups of, of Christians that held that, and even bishops of the church that would have been in different camps. And because of this great controversy, the church had to call a council to clarify uh, and make uh, what, what our belief is about Jesus Christ. And the first clarification came into the form of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and it's rather succinct, but the Apostles' Creed makes it very clear what we believe, right? But that didn't settle all the arguments. Uh, there were even more, so the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century got together and clarified it even more so, and so we have the Nicene Creed, uh, which is very explicit, and when you talk about the Father, it says exactly who the Father is. When, it, when we profess the Son, it says exactly who He is. It has more detail, and the same about the Holy Spirit, and the same about the Church and the Final Judgment. Uh, so there, is all, there was always controversy, and there always will be, and that's why we have the, the teaching authority of the Church to help us to sort things out, and when necessary, to make clarification statements or dogmas uh, to make sure that if we are to be Catholic, then this is what we believe. Uh, and so th there's a safeguard in that in terms of the, the teaching authority of the church. Okay. And you can see in the creed where it clearly starts out by saying, okay, Jesus really <clears throat> is God. But then it also very clearly goes on to show how he was really made, you know, in terms of suffering, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, to get your, that's why we talk about mystery. I mean, to say that he was fully God and fully man, my gosh, it, it really is hard to, mm -hmm. to comprehend. So we have to accept it in faith, right? We do. So with that said, <laughs> uh, what well, we... I, I just want to make one yes. recommendation. 
a great book to read about Jesus is the Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, if you want to really get a better picture and understanding, excellent book to read. All right. Level. How can the converted Jews, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah? I didn't hear the first part. How can, how, you can, how can you convince a Jew? You can't. Mm -hmm. Only God can. Okay? <laughs> so, so all you can do is lead them to the scriptures. You might share your own personal faith. But, but you have to ultimately just turn it over to the Lord. There were some Jews that did accept Jesus. Others that didn't. Uh, because Jesus didn't really fit the bill of what the Messiah was in their mind. They thought the Messiah would be a political leader that would conquer all their enemies here on earth and establish a nation for them, uh, which we call the Promised Land, here on earth. Whereas Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. It's in heaven. And so the Jew was waiting for a political conqueror, you know, like Napoleon. Uh, and that was not who Jesus was, so that's why they didn't accept him. So they're still anticipating this conqueror to come. And you can see how that still motivates the people of Israel to this day, that, that they are so concerned about their own country, their own uh, government, and fearful of anyone that would try to encroach upon that. Uh, and so they're rather militaristic. So their understanding of a Messiah was very militaristic and still is to this day. Um, so it's just a matter of helping them uh, to come to that truth, but if not in this life, they will uh, eventually in the life to come. Okay. Okay. With that said, yes, I'm sorry. Is it church doctrine that the four Gospels were written by the four apostles? That's a very good question. Is it church teaching that the four Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four apostles? More than likely, no. But the contents are from them, from an oral tradition. So what, what we have in those Gospels is an oral tradition attributed to them that a later editor put into a written form. So really you could say that, uh, that they had ghost writers. Uh, but it was from, uh, from their oral tradition, from their preaching. So let's say that uh, I think, as a priest, for the last 30 years, that Jesus is going to come back in my uh, time, and I'm preaching homilies every Sunday and going here, there, and everywhere. But I never write anything down or save anything. But somebody is listening, and then I die. Uh, they say, well, gosh, it's a shame that we would lose what was said. So let's gather together everything that he said and write it down into a book form where it makes sense. And there's a logic to it. So that's what the editor did. Uh, 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 would take the, the oral tradition of the eyewitness apostles to Jesus and put them into a written form. Now it's quite possible too that the editors might have been followers that would have seen, known Jesus younger. So, so you could still say that the editors that put the Gospels into a written form may have had eyewitness or, or in-person uh, experience of, of Jesus during his public ministry. Okay. But certainly the Gospel of John is written a hundred years after the resurrection, so there's no way that we could really say that John himself wrote it. Now he might have had notes that have been lost, we don't know. Um, more than likely no, uh, because of the nature of things then. So a scribe would have... Right. right. I actually, just a quick question. Uh, regarding John, I've seen some recent estimates that the Gospel of John is, is not as old as all that, and was more like 95 AD, in which case it is possible that that, that one may have actually been written by John. You don't know, right. It's possible. It's true. It's true. Yeah.